Hi, this is Barbara, and this is the review for test two. Okay, well, let's talk a little bit again about the principal parts of verbs. I know we talked about them already a lot. We will throughout the semester because they're just such a, it's just such an important concept in traditional grammar. The, the verb is like the center of everything. So once again, wait, let me see what color do I have? Yeah, that's good. That's grape because I'm using the crayon palette. So they all have great colors like uh, grape and sea foam. All right, this is grape. Okay. <laughs> okay, remember the infinitive, the past tense, the past participle. We've been talking about those now really since, since we started. And the infinitive, again, is the base of the verb, the, the uninflected, unconjugated, like default form of the verb. You know, the part of the verb you would look up in a really good dictionary. So, um, again, my favorite verb, my always example verb, eat, right? The infinitive is indeed eat. Sometimes we say that the infinitive has two in front of it, as in to eat. That's, that's fine. That's just kind of a convention. That doesn't mean that you have to have a two in front of it all the time. So, uh, if you just want to say eat, that's also the infinitive. And the past tense, the past participle, we talked about those last time. Remember that with both the past tense and the past participle, um, with a completely regular verb, we form them by adding ed to the infinitive, right? But there are many, many words, as you know, many verbs in English that are irregular. So you just have to memorize them. Um, eat, for example, the past tense is ate. And the past participle is eaten. Well, that looks very weird. Hang on. Let me write that with a better there. Okay. Eaten is the past participle. It's not eated. Okay. And this time, we, we started talking about the present participle, the fourth of the principal parts. And the present participle, remember, is the ing form. So that would be for eat. It would be eating, right? And the nice thing about the present participle, remember, is that it is entirely regular. So it's always going to be that ing form. Even with our most irregular verb in the language, which of course is be, the present participle is uh, being. So that, that, one's, that one's easy. And remember that as far as what we did with these things so far at this point, with the past participle, you remember that we used it to form the perfect tenses, some form of the auxiliary have, we used it to form the perfect tenses. And we also used the past participle with some form of the auxiliary to be to form the passive voice. And we use the present participle to form the progressive tenses. We'll talk about those a little bit more. All right, so remember that the past participle we use for the perfect tenses, I'm writing perfect there, and we also use the past participle for the passive voice. And the present participle we use for the progressive tenses. Should I write progressive? It's going to take me a long time. Progressive. Um, progressive tense is also sometimes called the progressive form. It's also sometimes called the continuous form, but it's the same thing. Okay, let's let's look at the progressive tenses then a little bit. Uh, I said a few times, you know, like, like if you would talk about a formula for something in grammar, we don't really talk about formulas, but if you did, the formula for the progressive tense would be, wait, I need a different color, aqua, aqua. Oh yeah, that's pretty, all right. Okay, the formula for the progressive tenses is the auxiliary to be and then the present participle, the ing form. So let's look at some of, of these sentences. I am sleeping in the tree tonight. That's not actually true, but it's, it's just a, an example of a progressive tense verb. So I'm going to underline the verb, the, the complete verb, right? Including all auxiliaries. I'm going to underline am sleeping. That whole thing is my verb. And obviously the subject is the pronoun I. I am sleeping. And you can see here with the, with the am, that's your to be auxiliary, right? And here, here's our ing, here's our, our present participle, 
So that gives us a progressive tense verb. And to figure out what, what tense you're dealing with specifically, uh, look, look at how that auxiliary, that auxiliary is conjugated. So I am, that's the present tense, right? If you would just say I am here. So this is the present progressive, present progressive tense, right? Okay, look at the next one. She will be catching flies for her lizard all night long. Okay, what's the verb here? The entire verb will be catching, right? We need all three of those words. We have two auxiliaries here, will be, and then our present participle, again with the ing over here, right? Will be catching. So will be catching, our entire verb. And obviously the subject here is she. So what would you say the tense of this progressive verb is? We'll look again at how the auxiliary to be is conjugated. It's in the future, right? So this is the future progressive tense of catch. I had a lizard when I was a kid, a very small lizard. He was, he was very pretty. He, she, I don't know. I never did know. How do you tell that? And if you only have one lizard, it's hard to tell. So I guess other lizards know how to tell, but he didn't like actual flies. Like mayflies. You could catch those at the, uh, around the, the porch light at night in the summertime. He wasn't the most expressive pet, but he was pretty. Okay, third sentence. I have been collecting chrome dinettes for several years. Here, what is our verb? Have been collecting, right? That whole thing. Again, we have two auxiliaries in our main verb, collecting. So have been collecting. And obviously the subject is I have been collecting. So what do you want to say about the tense here? If you look at just what's going on with the to be auxiliary, we have some form of have, so it has to be some kind of perfect thing, right? Okay, this is the present perfect progressive. They were running across the street. Here's our full verb again, were running. They is the subject, they were running across the street. It sounds like the chrome dinettes were running across the street, but that's, that's not what I mean. We don't know who they were. Well, anyway. So again, we have our to be auxiliary right here. We have our present participle right here, giving us some kind of progressive tense. If you look at what's going on with the were, that's the past of to be, right? So this is the past progressive. Does that all make sense? The progressive tense is really is really pretty simple because that present participle is, is always so regular. Just remember that you need some form of to be and you need the present participle, which is that ing form. All right, the passive voice was our, our, our first experience with a kind of grammatical transformation, what's called the transformation sometimes. And what you wanna remember about the passive voice Let's try strawberry. Strawberry? Oh yeah, that's good. Strawberry. I like that. All right, so the passive voice. Remember that only sentences with transitive verbs can become passive. Only sentences that have transitive verbs. So in the five sentence patterns we were talking about, that means only patterns, patterns three, four, and five could possibly ever become passive. Because remember that you need a direct object for this whole thing to even work. That's the whole point. You have to have a direct object. And of course, intransitive verbs don't have a direct object. Remember that the formula for the passive voice is to be as our auxiliary and the past participle. Okay? Remember again, let's go back to our principal parts of verbs, the past participle over here. Remember that we used it. I'm really making a mess on that now. Sorry. Uh, but we used it for the perfect tenses when we had have as an auxiliary. But if we use the past participle with be as an auxiliary, we get the passive voice. So there we are right here with our sort of formula to be plus the past participle. And remember that our third bullet point here as far as what's actually happening. If you think of the active sentence, the direct object of the active verb is going to become the subject of the passive verb. Does that make sense? So if we say the vampire liked, what did the vampire like? Coffee. Okay, 
The vampire likes coffee. The direct object here is what? Coffee, right? So if we're going to put this exact same sentence into the passive voice, the direct object, coffee, would kind of come all the way to the front to the subject position. And it would become, the coffee was liked by the vampire. Let's look at our sample sentences here. Okay, active and passive. The exact same sentence. Okay, active. The Komodo dragon ate the annoying child. Ooh, yeah, that's just so, so wrong. But <sighs> what is that slimy stuff hanging out of its mouth? Hmm. Anyway, okay, can you see in this active sentence that dragon is our subject and ate is our verb and our direct object, the thing the dragon ate, is the annoying child, okay? I guess Komodo, it's really kind of one big thing, right? The Komodo dragon, it's like the name of the species, so we could say that's one thing. Or you could also say that Komodo is, a, is an adjective modifying dragon. <laughs> Like what kind of a dragon it is, I guess. Okay, so the Komodo dragon ate the annoying child. And if we're going to put this exact same sentence into the passive voice, we want this direct object child over here to come to the front of the sentence into the subject slot. And we're going to use our, our formula over here for the the 2B plus the past participle. So here's our 2B auxiliary, right? Here's our past participle giving us the passive form of the verb to eat right here in this sentence. So the annoying child was eaten by the Komodo dragon. Yeah, does that make sense? Remember again that when you're, when you're transforming a sentence from active into passive or from passive into active, what you're really dealing with is the voice. And remember that the voice doesn't have anything to do with the tense. Those are two completely different qualities when you're talking about a verb. Tense only has to do with the time, with when something happened. Voice has to do with who did what to whom. It's, it's like which way the action went, if it went from a subject to an object or from the object to the subject. But it, it's not a tense issue. Every sentence in the passive voice does of course have some kind of tense but they're not they're really not related so I, I guess I want to emphasize that because a lot of times people uh, when they're trying to change a sentence from active into passive they actually end up changing the tense so be careful to not change the tense okay all right so we were careful there to stay in the past tense with eight and we kept our auxiliary to be here in the past tense as well. Okay, another kind of transformation we work with, direct questions. And then we talked about two different kinds of questions, of course, yes or no questions and questions that need some kind of information. And uh, again, that's something you you really know very well, but maybe, maybe never stop to think about. Of course, you know, like, let me see, let me give you an example of a yes or no question. Do you like to eat breakfast at the courtesy diner? Yes or no, right? That would be yes or no. If I asked you, do you like to eat breakfast at the courtesy diner, and you answered Barbara, that wouldn't match. That wouldn't fit. That wouldn't make any sense, right? Right. Okay. Look over here at the first, first bullet point here. If your verb in your sentence is be in the present or past tense, the subject and the verb switch positions. In other words, if you're using be in a form that, that has only one, one word, it doesn't have an auxiliary with it, you switch the subject and the verb. So I am hungry here in our statement, right? I am hungry becomes am I hungry. I is still your subject and am is still your verb, but they're, they've switched like that. With other one word verbs, one word verbs, that means verbs that don't have an auxiliary, use the correct tense of the auxiliary do plus the infinitive. And again, that's something you're probably, you know, you've probably used your whole life, but maybe never stopped to think about. So here's my sample sentence. I loved my Ford Escort. Yeah, it, my Ford Escort was not very fast, but 
it was a cool car. Okay, so I loved my Ford Escort. Escort, of course, is my direct object here. Becomes, did I love my Ford Escort? I had a one-word verb there, loved, right? And that means that I'm going to use the auxiliary do conjugated in the same tense as the verb in the statement. So do in the past tense because loved is in the past tense. So did love is my verb here. I, of course, is still the subject. Ford Escort is still the direct object. Did I love my Ford Escort? Question mark. If the verb has an auxiliary, down here, okay, if the verb has an auxiliary, the subject and the first auxiliary switch positions. So the statement, the snake had shed its skin, becomes had the snake shed its skin. Do you see our verb here, had shed, past perfect tense, our auxiliary had. Do you see that we put the had then in front of the snake like this? But in the question, our verb is still had shed. Snake had shed. Remember too that you always need that question mark at the end. I, I know that seems kind of like something you know, but don't forget it. A, a lot of times people kind of forget that that needs to be there. It does need to be there in English. Okay, direct questions that need some kind of information. These are the ones that don't make any sense if you answer with yes or no, right? Questions that need information use interrogatives. And an interrogative is a word that really replaces the missing information. They're sometimes called the journalist journalist question words, who, what, when, where, why, how, how much. Um, so the, the words that really are the clue that you, you need to answer with some kind of information. Okay, let's take a look at our sample sentence here. Wally and the beaver put the baby alligator in the toilet tank. Have you ever seen this episode? Where um, they they found an ad for an, an alligator in, in the back of a comic book. And they're kind of expecting it to be this eight foot long alligator, like in a, you know, a crate and everything. And, and it's, it's this little like seven inch long baby alligator in this tiny little box. And they, uh, they keep it in the toilet tank so their mom won't find it. Well, I'm not going to tell you what happens because it's, I don't want to destroy that for you, you know, I don't want to spoil it, so. They don't flush it down the toilet, but, uh, okay, so, so let's look at three example questions that need information. What did Wally and the beaver put in the toilet tank? Who put the baby alligator in the toilet tank? Where did Wally and the beaver put the alligator? Okay, and you kind of want to think when you're re looking at the relationship between the statement and the question, you kind of want to look at what the interrogative word is replacing, if you know what I mean. So in that first example, what did Wally and the beaver put in the toilet tank? What in, well, I'm going to confuse you with saying what again, because I'm giving you yet another uh, information question. But what is it in this statement that's being replaced by the interrogative what here. It's obviously the baby alligator, right? That's, that's the what. So that's what we are replacing with the interrogative what. And in the second one, who put the baby alligator in the toilet tank? Well, that's obviously Wally and the beaver. And in the third example, where did Wally and the beaver put the baby alligator? Well, that is replacing the prepositional phrase in the toilet tank. Because the prepositional phrase there is really functioning adverbially, telling us where something happened, so in the toilet tank. What you can see here, too, a couple of things I really want to just remind you. One thing, remember that when you're dealing with a direct question, the interrogative needs to be at the beginning of the sentence, at the, at the front, okay? It doesn't stay in the same position as the part of the sentence that it's replacing. So... With a direct question, you wouldn't want to say, Wally and the beaver put what in the toilet tank? Question mark. Because that's not actually following the syntax that a direct question needs. That kind of a question where you just follow the exact syntax of the statement is called actually an echo question. And they really only come up in, uh, in narrative sometimes where you want to express disbelief or something. You ate what? But in a direct question, you want to make sure that 
the interrogative is at the front of the sentence. Okay? All right, and you also want to remember that when you think of the statement and you think of, of whatever part of the statement the interrogative is replacing, in the question, the interrogative will function the same way in the sentence. So let me clean up some of this. All right, that's better. Okay, what I wanted to show, for example, is in this sentence, if you look at just what's going on structurally in this thing as a sentence, Wally and the beaver is obviously still our subject, right? Our verb is did put, and again, we have the auxiliary did there because we're dealing with a one-word verb. We need the auxiliary did in a question. So Wally and Beaver did put what in the toilet tank? Do you see, it? just as in the original sentence, Wally and the Beaver put the alligator in the toilet tank, the what replaces the alligator. And because alligator in the original statement is a direct object, the interrogative what is also a direct object in the question. So the interrogative will have the same function in the question as the original word or phrase that it replaced in the statement. Okay, so in the other one too, who, because it replaces Wally and the beaver, which is the subject of the statement, in the second example, who is the subject of put. And in the third example, where, replaces the entire prepositional phrase in the toilet tank. So it's kind of functioning as an adverb there because it's telling us where. But the subject, Wally and the Beaver, verb, did put, baby alligator, again, that stays the same as it was in the original statement. All right, watch out for some of these potentially tricky situations. Okay, why are these tricky? Let you look at this for just a second. All right. Don't get these confused. And I wanted to give you these because you see that they all begin with the cat was, but very different things are going on here. Do you, do you see what it is? The cat was beautiful. The cat was a stray. You know, I'm going to get rid of this big thing because I don't want to confuse you. But I'm going to, going to kind of cluster these two together, clump these two together because they are related. Do you see what's going on? Both of these sentences are patterned two sentences with a subject and a linking verb and a subjective complement. The only difference is that beautiful is, of course, an adjective subjective complement and stray is a noun subjective complement. But those are both patterned two sentences. In the second two examples. The cat was chasing the squirrel and the cat was being chased by the bear. I don't know, I got away from the whole reptile theme, but okay, so back ma back to mammals now. Now the to be verb was is no longer functioning as a linking verb, but as an auxiliary verb because it's really part of a larger verb. Was chasing and was being chased. Our verb in those last two sentences is actually chase in each sentence. What's going on in this sentence here? The cat was chasing the squirrel. Well, that's was chasing in the past progressive tense, right? Remember that we need some form of to be as, an our, as our auxiliary and our present participle. And in the fourth sentence, the cat was being chased by the bear. Well, we have an ing, which is kind of a good clue that we have some kind of progressive tense. We have to be plus the past participle, which is a pretty good clue that we're dealing with the passive voice. So this last sentence is in the passive voice, in the past progressive tense, right? Finally, let me just remind you uh, once again of that check sheet on pages 57 to 59. It's the kind of review at the end of the unit. And some of that you already looked at for, uh, for test one because we split this unit in the book up into two different test periods. But you might want to take a look at that again. And remember too, this is maraschino. I think it's just red, but it says maraschino. Okay. Absolutely crucial, again, remember to make sure you have a good handle on the difference between a direct object and a subjective complement. And essentially that difference comes down to making sure that you understand 
the difference between a transitive verb and an intransitive verb. Remember, a transitive verb is a verb that has a direct object. An intransitive verb does not have a direct object. If it's a, if it's a linking verb, it might have a subjective complement, but it's never going to have a direct object. So look at these, these last two sentences as an example of the, these two situations, transitive and intransitive. She became a detective. She saw a detective. Structurally, they look very similar, don't they? Because you have subject, verb, and then another noun, and you have a subject and a verb, and then another noun. In this case, each, each noun coming after the verb is detective. But these two sentences are very, very different. Can you explain why they're as different as they are? They're, they're different in an important way. And it has to do with the verb. And in this sentence, became, this sentence, saw. In this sentence with became, we have a linking verb. A linking verb. The second sentence, saw, we have a transitive verb. A transitive verb. In the first sentence, detective is a noun subjective complement. It's restating she. She is the detective. She didn't do something to the detective. She and the detective are the same thing. In the second example, detective is the thing she saw. She saw the detective. She and the detective are not the same thing. It's, it's something outside of herself that she saw. So this example has to do with the noun and the subjective complement being the same thing. This example has to do with the noun and the direct object definitely not being the same thing. And it's the verb that really communicates that, the difference between transitive and intransitive. So once again, transitive verb has a direct object, intransitive doesn't. Okay, that's it. I know, I know. See you later. All right, Captain Jack, back into your aquarium.